Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, hello from Thailand and also to other parts of the region, other parts of the world. Um, hi to uh, members from UNESCO, also our distinguished panelists. Um, we're here with uh, members joining us from every corner from Zoom and also joining us on the Facebook Live on the UNESCO Bangkok Facebook page. Um, so we are here to celebrate the webinar launch of the Global Report, Ready to Learn and Thrive, School Health and Nutrition Around the World. And I am sure everybody is incredibly elated. Um, first off, I would like to introduce myself as the moderator of today's webinar. My name is Chichia Bunyaratha Han, and I'm currently a fifth year medical student at Chualongkorn University. Um, I'm here representing the International Federation of Medical Students Associations in Thailand, um, which is a student run nonprofit organization representing Thai medical students. So, founded in 2002, IFMSA Thailand has its committees and members from all 24 medical schools in Thailand, and we work to connect medical students to international peers through being a member of the International Federation of Medical Students Association. All right, so to begin our webinar today, um, first off, I would like to start with a few housekeeping information. So as you already know, um, this meeting is going to be recorded and also photos will be taken. And also it will be streamed live on the UNESCO Bangkok Facebook page. And as for naming, um, kindly make sure that you are signed in as uh, your first name, underscore your last name, underscore your country or organization. And during the meeting, there's going to be um, a series of presentations and also panel discussions. So if you have any um, questions or discussions, um, feel free to use the Q&A box to ask questions to the presenters. And the UNESCO team will work forward to um, promptly answering those questions. Okay, and next, um, since we're discussing the report, um, we can move to the objectives of the webinar. So this virtual launch event aims to showcase and disseminate the findings of the joint report, highlighting findings from the Asia Pacific region to discuss on the report's key messages and also raise awareness on the importance of school health and nutrition programs and highlight country examples of school health and nutrition programs being implemented by governments, schools, and young people in the region. And without further ado, um, I would like to move on to the opening remarks by Dr. Suvaji Good, the Regional Advisor and Focal Point for the Health Promoting Schools, WHO Ciaro, on behalf of the thematic working group on school health, nutrition, and well-being, and the co-published report partner. Dr. Suvaji Khat, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tatiya. And good morning, good afternoon, my colleagues, my friends, and all the partners in this webinar. I'm so glad that we are here together to launch this very important report. I would like to echo numbers of works that we have been doing together as the joint UN working groups for this uh, school health, nutrition, and comprehensive process for health promoting school. If we recall, this is one and a half year of journey together. This webinar is one of the series that we had, and I would like to recall our efforts of the joint UN statement on the strengthening of the education, school health, nutrition, and well-being that's signed by all of our regional directors of UNESCO, UNICEF, UNFPA, World Food Program, and the World Health Organizations, while we are build, building back better from the COVID-19, we also to adopt very comprehensive approach for health promoting school to strengthen numbers of infrastructure and educational content to appropriately meet the needs of the learners and the school personnel, including services such as provisions of these adequate water sanitation, uh, nutrition, including school meals, and micronutrient supplementation, mental health, psychosocial supports, and preparedness for future emergencies. In this region, we're quite committed to support collaborations and coordinations with donors and partners agency, including the civil societies, for the opportunity of this experience sharing and learning within and across countries in the region. I'm very welcome to see all of 
our partner agency in these panelists. I'm very pleased to see that we all also include member states because we also have an uh, interministerial meeting since October of 2021 during the COVID-19. Our Minister of Health and Ministers of Education, Joy Han, within the 11 countries of Southeast Asia Regional Office of uh, WHO, to commit uh, committed to ensure the adequate and equitable distributions of resources at the national, subnational, and school levels to bolster the capacities and functioning of existing school health program to achieve the global standard and indicators of health promoting school, safe school operations and ensure preparedness and resilience within schools are prioritized to build forward a healthier and more robust function of school health program to prevent and respond the future public health issues. And I would like to also uh, share with you the most recent World Health Assemblies, 76 sessions in May and June of this year, 2023, there are three important resolutions worth mentioning that related to the school health programs. That one of the resolutions is on accelerate plans and support the member states to implement the recommendations and managing obesity over the life course, especially starting at the younger age. We also have important resolutions on accelerating efforts for preventing micronutrient deficiency and consequences with safe and effective food fortifications and accelerate actions on global drowning prevention. In this webinar, I would like to link with some important uh, statistic that we learned that more than 312 million preschool children and 1.2 billion women of reproductive age are affected by micronutrient deficiency, which is an alarming public health concern. So this report coming out in a very timely manner to help our member state to understand how to promote health and balance that and nutritional education for the populations in need especially targeting of the populations in schools and child health programs. And when we adopt health promoting schools, it means we also reach out to the teachers, to the parents and the community close by the school. So we know the school health and nutrition are cost-effective investment, feasible at all settings, and can deliver significant development gains. The ready to learn and thrive reports give us opportunities to learn from other countries and also sharing experience that we may not gather before. So this webinar is very important for South Asia and the Pacific countries to share these experiences. And I'm really welcome all the panelists and congratulate to our organizers and partner agency who bring together quite numbers of panelists and participants in this meeting. I wish you a very successful deliberations and I'll continue to hear your experience through this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your welcoming remarks, Dr. Suwiji. Um, it is really heartwarming to see that we have such important stakeholders um, getting involved in the development of this report. And I believe that um, we're going to be highlighting key points for action taking that's going to really mobilize change in a lot of communities, especially in the Asia Pacific. And as we know that school health is incredibly important, um, healthy and well-nourished children will learn better um, and also ensuring that girls and boys stay in school. It's incredibly important to build um, a foundation that will develop their human capital for an individual to put fully potentially achieve in life. So now we're going to be watching a short video. It is titled Healthy and Educated School Health and Nutrition for Every Learner. Please enjoy.
School is so much more than a place of learning. It's a lifeline to nutrition, health, and physical and mental well-being for children and adolescents. COVID-19 school closures not only affected children's education, it also left over 370 million children without essential school-based health care, nutrition, protection, psychosocial support, and health literacy services when they needed it most. As schools have reopened, we must ensure all learners access to school-based health and nutrition programs. <laughs> Without them, mental health, poverty and malnutrition are made worse for millions of the world's poorest children. When children are well nourished, they have better health and well-being, stay in school longer and will ultimately have more opportunities to escape poverty and thrive. To protect every child's right to learn, we need to work together and invest in the health, well-being and nutrition of all school children. <laughs> Together, from principals and teachers to government officials, parents and partners, we can give learners the opportunity to access the learning they need and the nutrition, health and protection they deserve. <laughs> We must ensure every child's right to learn, survive and thrive. For every learner, for every school, a healthy start. Thank you. So essentially this video highlights our point that investing in school-based health and nutrition interventions really contributes to a well-nourished, healthy and educated population. And ultimately this will lead to long-term growth and also sustainable and inclusive development. All right, so as we've laid out the foundation for this meeting, we will move on to another highlight of the webinar today. So next will be the presentation of key highlights from the report by Ms. Janelle Bob, Regional Advisor, Education for Health and Wellbeing at UNESCO Bangkok. Ms. Janelle, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kuntataya. Uh, thank you, Kun Savaji, and to all of our great listeners joining us uh, both uh, through the internet, on Facebook Live, or by Zoom. We're delighted to be with you. Uh, as Sataya mentioned, this event is co-hosted by the Asia-Pacific Thematic Working Group on School Health, Nutrition, and Wellbeing. And the report itself is co-published by a range of partners, the logos of which you can see on screen, UNESCO, UNICEF, uh, FAO, WHO, uh, World Food Program and GPE all coming together and joining hands on this important issue. So I will dive straight into uh, a rather dense slide deck that I hope will still be digestible to all of our viewers joining and will really create some food for thought um, as we get into some deeper discussion. So the slide deck is going to come up now. Fantastic. And next slide. So the focus of the Global Status Report reminds us of what we already know, that education and health are two sides of the same coin that mutually reinforce each other. Next slide. There are six key messages from the Global Report that we will look at more closely in this presentation with each key message further illustrated with relevant and available data from Asia Pacific region. These were the key messages highlighted in the global launch event for the release of the global report held earlier this year on 8th February. Before jumping into the findings, we thought that it may be useful to briefly say something about the key concepts, rationale and methodology used in the data analysis and data summaries. First, what exactly are we talking about when we're talking about school health and nutrition programs? School health and nutrition programs aim to protect and promote the physical and mental health, nutrition, well-being, and development of school-age children and adolescents and the wider school community through coordinated and comprehensive strategies, activities, services that are integrated and sustained within the education system. Policies and laws that provide an enabling environment at national, subnational, and school levels Education for health and well-being delivered through skills-based school curricula and extracurricular activities, a school physical and socio-emotional environment that is safe, 
inclusive and conducive to health, well-being and learning, school health and nutrition services, and school feeding programs that provide simple, safe, and effective health interventions and healthy school meals. So all of these working together are what constitute school health and nutrition programs. Now, because the global report and launch event presented data from around the world, for this Asia Pacific launch, we have done some secondary analysis of the global data sets in order to extract data that is specific to this region. These data will be publicly presented today for the first time. The global analysis began by examining quantitative and qualitative data from 44 global and regional data sets on school health nutrition policies and interventions and desk review published and unpublished literature. This was further complemented by additional analysis of qualitative and quantitative data sources and supplemented by expert interviews and other types of dialogues with experts in the field. Therefore, the analysis covers about 75 indicators, and these are organized into four broad categories, which you will see not only on this slide and the next. So I'm not going to ask you to read the, the details uh, of the slides, but just to, to indicate the four categories and the, the, the depth of indicators being covered. So we have policies and laws, education for health and well-being, and the second two categories on this slide, which are school physical and socio-emotional environment, health and nutrition services, together with school feeding programs. Now, in this presentation, we'll only have time to illustrate a few of the findings from just a handful of these indicators, but there are data for, from the Asia Pacific for most of these indicators. In this presentation, we will only have time to, um, we'll, we encourage you colleagues to really read the full status report for a fuller picture. And just to say a quick word about limitations, uh, like the global data set, there are limitations in the availability, comparability, and quality of data. And more information is available on policies in high income countries than in middle and low income countries. And there are gaps in data on program implementation and some specific aspects of school health and nutrition programs. So more work needs to be done there. So the data in this presentation are summarized in two ways. It's either summarized by country income level, according to the 2022 World Bank country classification, or it's organized by geographic subregion as used by the UN Economic and Social Commission, ESCAP, for Asia and the Pacific. And the, these are the subregions that you can see on screen, East and Northeast Asia, North and Central Asia, the Pacific, Southeast Asia, and South and Southwest Asia. And data were collected from 57 countries. So now we'll dive into some of the key findings. Here's our first key message, that the health and nutrition and well-being of learners are key determinants of education outcomes and an integral part of quality education. We know that school meals increase learners' enrollment and attendance rates as much as 9% in terms of enrollment and 8% in terms of attendance, respectively. We know that access to school health services can positively impact learning achievement, a 5% higher probability of passing tests in reading and mathematics when learners are provided free vision screening and glasses. We know that there's a considerable reduction in school absenteeism, especially in lower income countries when there is strong attention to hygiene, for instance, through promotion of hand washing, and we also know that gender equitable and gender transformative health education, health education curricula, such as comprehensive sexuality education, can help reduce school dropout among girls as a result of poor reproductive health, including early and undetected pregnancy. Here's our second key message. And actually, Dr. Suvaji mentioned this in her opening, which is that almost every country in the Asia and Pacific region implements school health and nutrition programs. For this indicator, data was collected from 23 countries from the region. A vast majority of countries, some 83%, demonstrate having standards for health promoting schools, whereas 13% do not. We have a 4% who are uh, reported unknown. 52% of the countries that do provide standards belong to the lower middle income group. And the 3% of countries that do not provide standards actually belong to the upper middle income group. Here, we're looking at nutrition education in the school curriculum. 27 countries reported including nutrition education in school curricula, while 19 countries reported that they did not. Most of the countries which do provide nutrition education classify as lower middle income or upper middle income, with only four countries classed as high income. 
There was no link low income country that reported including nutrition education in their school curricula. In this slide, we look at children receiving school feeding. We have two classifications combined in this one graph on children reached by school feeding programs. The upper half of the graph uh, is looking at subregion and the lower half of the graph by country income group, summarizing data from 36 countries. Children receiving school feeding are mostly living in middle income countries in Asia Pacific, predominantly lower middle income countries that are located across South and Southwest Asia. In several country contexts, school feeding is often bundled together with other kinds of school-based health and well-being interventions. Data from 23 countries show that the most prevalent kind or accompaniment to school feeding programs are hand washing initiatives, while the least prevalent initiative involves menstrual hygiene. Roughly in the middle are health interventions that target learners' deworming and their dental cleaning. Here's our third key message. School health and nutrition programs are a cost-effective investment, feasible in all settings, and deliver significant developmental gains. And that's an echo of something that Dr. Suvaji uh, said in her opening. And these gains are felt across multiple outcomes and sectors, including education, health and nutrition, social protection, and food and agriculture. And this finding is universally relevant. Some studies show that for every one US dollar invested in school feeding programs, returns nine US dollars. Here's our fourth key message, that school health and nutrition promote inclusion and equity in education and health, but more needs to be done to reach those who are missing out. On this slide, we can see data from 43 countries on delivery of school-based immunization services. In all regions, except South and Southwest Asia, there are as many countries or more countries that report delivering school-based immunization than do not deliver these services. Often those learners who are not being reached by school health and nutrition programs, including school health services, or not being reached by programs that are actually responding to their needs are those who are already socially or economically vulnerable. Depending on country context, this includes learners with disabilities, ethno-linguistic minority learners, girls, boys, learners who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, displaced or refugee learners, and often these vulnerabilities are intersecting. This slide is concerned with the phenomena of violence against children, and specifically school violence. It looks at the situation across a range of countries between 34 and 38, depending on the measurement domain, on the perceptions by government respondents of the reach of education and training in order to prevent violence against children. This is according to the INSPIRE framework, which is a set of evidence-based strategies for countries and communities working to eliminate violence against children. The education and training that's mapped out in this graph would be for both students and school staff as appropriate and covering five thematic areas of the INSPIRE framework that you can see on the legend on the right of the graph. The thematic area where most countries, some 14 out of 37, believe that programs were reaching those in need was that of life and social skills education for learners. That's the tall green bar. The thematic area with the fewest countries, three out of 34, where government respondents believe that programs are reaching those in need was on dating violence prevention among learners. That's the dark blue bar at the far right of the graph. In this graph, we can see the status of the integration into secondary education curricula in 28 countries of key topics of comprehensive sexuality education. This is also data reported by government officials and most countries quite favorably, and some of which is contested in other evidence, uh, report on this. As many of, as 60% of countries reporting that topics on HIV and STI, as well as gender and gender norms are extensively covered in secondary curricula, while only 40 to 50% of countries report on topics of pregnancy and contraception being extensively covered in secondary curricula. Our fifth key message, more attention must be paid to the school environment, which is so critical to health and learning. And the data here is really relating to Sustainable Development Goal 4 Education, uh, target 4.8.1. That is to ensure all children have access to a safe, inclusive and effective learning environment by 2030. This slide focuses on the physical learning environment, looking at basic sanitation services, which are defined by WHO and UNICEF 
as improved sanitation facilities that are not shared with another household. And improved sanitation facilities include flush or pour, poured toilets to piped sewer systems, septic tanks or pit latrines, ventilated pitch latrines, composting toilets or pit latrines with slabs. Based on 2020 data from 29 countries, there's quite a range of realities going on on this slide. In three countries, less than 30% of schools have received such services, while in nine countries, 100% of schools report having such services. The picture is very similar in this slide when looking at data on basic hygiene services. And the priority indicator for this one is the presence of a hand washing facility with soap and water. In this slide, also based on 2020 data in 28 countries, there are four countries in which less than a third of schools have such services and 11 countries in which all schools report having basic hygiene services. Inclusive learning environments are also those that are disability inclusive. Here we can see the situation using 2021 data of schools with infrastructure to enable access by learners with disabilities at the three levels of education, not excluding, not including pre-primary. So we're covering primary, lower secondary, and upper secondary. Within each subregion, the picture is quite mixed according to education level. However, in the Southeast Asia subregion, five of the six reporting countries have less than 50% of schools that at all education levels have accessible infrastructure for students with disabilities. And here's our final key message. Number six, that strengthening coverage and impact requires programs that are comprehensive, responsive to the context, and sustained by policy and financial commitments. A very encouraging 83% of countries report having a policy on school feeding, and you can see the distribution by subregion here. Looking at the next slide here, let's see the change over a seven year period of the proportion of children receiving school feeding. In total, there has been an increase by 4% in the number of children receiving school feeding in the Asia Pacific region since 2013. While three subregions reported an increase in numbers, with the greatest occurring in North and Central Asia, the South and Southwest Asia and Southeast Asia subregions both reported a decrease. Interestingly, if we look at this data by income group, only countries from the upper middle income group reported an increase. Low income countries reported the greatest decrease with 56%. So we have high level of policy commitment, but still not yet reaching all those in need. So some concluding, some concluding thoughts. School health and nutrition programs are absolutely one of the most widely implemented public policies around the world. And clearly governments in most countries are already investing in the health and well-being of school-aged children and adolescents through these programs. These investments demonstrate growing recognition of the central role of the school system in health, nutrition, and well-being of children and adolescents. And while there has been significant progress, more needs to be done to ensure that these programs are comprehensive, implemented at scale, and meet the needs of all learners. Improving the quality, relevance, and reach of school health and nutrition programs really do offer a unique opportunity to transform education and the lives of children and adolescents in this region. In Asia Pacific, there really is already fertile ground and a strong foundation for accelerating impact on school health and nutrition programming. Partnerships between the education and health sector and other sectors that became even closer, even stronger during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic now need to be scaled up and sustained and systematized. We also need coordinated action between partners to close the gap on key evidence across all eight of the global standards on health promoting schools. We need better understanding of program coverage, quality and impact in order to be able to put the well-being of learners at the center of the mission of transformed education. So in concluding, please do like, download, share the report that's already available online. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Janelle. Um, you've, uh, it's been amazing for you to recap the summary from the report and also you know, uh, presenting to us um, the main highlights that we really need to pay attention to. It was really comprehensive. And um, I think you mentioned a lot of key topics that we might have missed out in some of the policy implementation. For example, topics of um, sexual and reproductive health and rights or access to clean water, for instance. 
Um, so as we've um, heard from the key report, uh, we will move on to our next um, event on the show today. Um, it will be a panel discussion from many distinguished guests. And um, next, I would like to pass on uh, to our panel moderator, Ms. Vera Meyer, Regional School Feeding Advisor of the World Food Program. Ms. Vera, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kuntitaya. So now we're moving into the second part of this uh, webinar, and we are inviting four panelists to talk about school health and nutrition. We're going to address various topics that have been now presented in the overview of the report, ranging from uh, school health and nutrition as an investment with high returns, talking about comprehensive and sustainable programs, talking about the importance of partnerships for sustainability, and about policy and financing. Let me first introduce to you the four speakers we will be having. First of all, we have uh, Dr. Maria Corazon Dumlao, the Chief of the School Health Division in the Department of Education in the Philippines. Thank you very much for joining us. Our second speaker is Dr. Susie Pereira, the Deputy Director of the General Public Health Services in the Ministry of Health of Sri Lanka. Our third speaker, is Ms. Neha Mala, the co-founder and director of programs of social change makers in innovation in Nepal. And last but not least, our fourth speaker, Ms. Joyce Tico, the head of school from Bishop Campton Primary in Fiji. We're going to ask you questions in two rounds. Please make sure you provide concise answers as we only have one hour for this panel discussions. I would also like to invite participants to put their questions into the chat. And if there is time, we would like to direct these questions to the speakers and respond to them as part of this webinar. First of all, we would like to talk about the investment and sustainability of the school health and nutrition programs, understanding that these programs are an investment with multi-sector returns. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Dumlao to share with us a couple of examples of how investing in comprehensive school and nutrition programs in the Philippines has benefited education, learning, and learners. Also, if you could tell us about the things that are working well and that must be maintained or scale up so that school health and nutrition programs remain responsive to the changing needs and are impactful with regards to their stated objective. The floor is yours, Dr. Dumla. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to share our uh, initiatives at the Department of Education Philippines. We implement uh, the Oplan Kalisugan for DepEd or Operational Plan for Health, which uh, converge all the six flagship programs on health. So we have the school-based feeding program with nutrition support, wash in schools, provision of medical dental services, adolescent reproductive health, school mental health, and uh, substance use prevention. Now, um, two uh, very big programs that are heavily invested are the school-based feeding program. We allocate 6 billion pesos for FY 2023 to, uh, to provide the learners with um, either hot meals or nutritious food products, we, which we adopted as dry ration during the pandemic. And um, we have linked a school-based feeding program with the uh, um, complementary activities like washing schools and uh, other provision of medical, dental, and nursing services and nutrition support together with the Ulayan Sa Paaralan or school gardens. We are a member of the School Meals Coalition with uh, the World Food Program who are already working with us. We have a technical working group on washing schools where uh, discussions are being made at the higher level. And uh, we work with GISED, Save the Children, and uh, uh, UNICEF and other development partners. Uh, for the uh, school-based interventions, we have the online monitoring system for the WINS where we can already uh, see the... Um, we can and uh, identify already the schools uh, without uh, wash facilities. And uh, uh, we can see 
we can also allocate stars. Uh, we have uh, the three star approach and uh, we provide technical uh, support to all the schools. What we're trying to say is that uh, we are always uh, are trying to innovate and address the different uh, problems when it comes to school health. We have policies and programs in place. However, we still need to strengthen our uh, partnership to address uh, uh, the different uh, issues. Uh, right now, uh, we have the healthy learning institutions and uh, um, healthy learning institutions of Plan Kalisugan Sadepted uh, member joint uh, administrative order with the Department of Health, uh, Commission on Higher Education, Department of Social Welfare and Development, uh, TESDA, and uh, also the Legal College Board to ensure that uh, this uh, national platform will uh, be uh, the, um, the working platform where we come up with the standards, we focus uh, resources for school health, and uh, we align it with the universal health care of uh, the Philippines. So um, this challenges of convergence, not only within the Department of Education, but within the, with, within the government sectors, this is really very important. Uh, so that the gaps can be addressed by the different partners. So we continue to strengthen our health and nutrition programs and come up with the local researches uh, within the school setting as well as uh, partnership with our uh, local partners. In the interest of time, uh, I cannot discuss all the researches that see you know, educational outcomes, improve attendance, uh, decrease absenteeism, improvement in the nutritional status, engaging partners to focus resources on school health and uh, putting premium in So, Dr. Dumlao, we're having trouble hearing you. Other uh, uh, basic. Uh, it's is it okay now? Is it okay now? Mom, is it okay now? Yes, we confirm it's okay. Maybe if you switch off your camera. Yes, I have already switched off my camera. Uh, the later part of uh, my um, uh, highlight for uh, the question is that there's a need for uh, convergence of all programs and projects addressing health and adolescent, uh, child and adolescent health, and also um, connecting and collaborating uh, with the various agencies like the Department of Health, which we already have the joint administrative order for the implementation of healthy learning institutions or school setting as a response to the universal health care. And uh, we uh, implement the life course approach in our design of programs and projects. So we continue our partnership with the local government units and also with development partners. Thank you. Thank you very much for your intervention, Dr. Dumlao. Now we would like to move to Dr. Susie Pereira to present us with a country experience to complement what has been said from the Philippines with Sri Lanka. Dr. Susie Pereira, could you please tell us more about how to holistically support the health and well being of members of the learning community? And how are some ways that the Ministry of Health of Sri Lanka is collaborating with the education sector to comprehensively deliver and monitor the school health and nutrition program? We know that this sort of institutional coordination is really critical to the success of the program. So if you could tell us of how this is working in Sri Lanka, and also how are schools, families, and then the wider community engaged in such processes, and how this 
sort of multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder partnership is increasing the sustainability of the program. Over to you, Dr. Susi Pereira. Um, thank you very much. And uh, firstly, I would like to appreciate uh, this comprehensive uh, report that has been uh, that is being launched today, and um, it truly spells out the problems and highlights the achievements and also the the way forward probably that countries need to take on. So coming to Sri Lanka, I think uh, uh, we have had a very long school health program, almost coming to a uh, hundred years now, and. Um, it started off as being very uh, medical oriented in identifying health issues of uh, school children as a screening program and also in giving uh, um, deworming and such things in, in the schools uh, way back. I'm talking of a historical perspective. But now what we are seeing is a strong collaboration that has existed uh, what uh, initially came out as a, a, a medical a health uh, program, but now it is uh, a education uh, focused uh, program uh, where the education uh, sector takes the lead and we from the health sector provides the necessary inputs into a more health promotion and comprehensive education and a school uh, nutrition feeding program. So uh, we have uh, uh, like 360 medical officer of health units, which lies closely with all the schools in, in the areas. So it's because uh, health and education are both a decentralized subject. Um, we have to take into consideration the decentralized structure uh, where uh, the school medical inspections are done. But now the school nutrition program is where the, the health ministry has given very clear guidance on what kind of composition should be there in the school meals. And uh, the school meals are being uh, provided through the support of the government where it's being uh, um, a certain amount of uh, fund allocation is made which goes directly to the schools through the uh, education ministry goes down to the schools. The meal has to be prepared at the school level with the support of the school societies and the, the health has a very clear uh, role uh, at the grassroots level to ensure that the uh, cooking facilities, the nutritious meals are uh, as per the guidance of the health sector because we have given what are the meals that can be uh, provided uh, which is uh, which conforms to the calorie requirements as also the fat protein and uh, highlighting the need for uh, less high sugar fat uh, high sugar food less fatty food and uh, conforming to the calorie requirements. So these things are, uh, it's difficult right now because of the economic uh, recession that we are going through. So the support from uh, development partners have come in a big way uh, to ensure that these meals are uh, possible uh, to the schools, but it is the primary schools and all the schools which have less than thousand children are being uh, we are trying to cover uh, all of these uh, schools so the, the education and the health have a very strong uh, sectoral the, the intersectoral uh, the coordination is very strong and the monitoring happens to ensure that there is clean and uh, hygienically appropriate measures are practiced in order to get this stipulated school meal to the children. And of course, uh, this needs a very, uh, we also we also know that, uh, in, especially in this economic recession, we are noting that providing the school meal is very important 
uh, in some of the areas to get the children to the schools uh, to ensure that there are no dropouts. So I think this is uh, this very important for us. And uh, we have also noted, uh, I think it might be relevant for the others also, that uh, we were uh, giving diet supplements and all of that. We wanted to get into the fortification, so fortified rice, and we were getting support of World Food Program also coming to, uh, to see that fortified rice is uh, distributed. But we also know that, that uh, some of the micronutrient surveys that are being done, uh, we are finding that the population, the iron, uh, it is not uh, iron deficiency, but it is anemia of another cause. So I think it's, it may be interesting for the other countries also to see what is the profile of this uh, uh, anemia to ensure that uh, we are giving the, the right uh, intervention to the schools. Uh, when we are addressing anemia. But uh, the health promoting schools is what uh, is being advocated by the health, health sector to the education sector. And we are increasingly finding that comprehensive education, which builds the skillful the competencies for uh, being health pro promoting schools, is something that we are really pressing on. So I will stop for now because I think there's a second round of uh, questions. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you very much for your intervention. And we really welcome the nutrition sensitive approach of the school meals program in Sri Lanka and also are very happy to see the recent change in the rations that provide an even better menu to the children. We also see your point highlighting the lack of data in terms of uh, the nutrition of school age children to better address their needs. And I think as a community, we jointly have to bridge this evidence gap. Now we would like to move to a different topic, uh, understanding that policy and legal regulations are essential for the sustainable implementation of quality national programs on school health and nutrition. And I would like to go back to have an example from the Philippines, from Dr. Dumlao, and would like her to talk about what you consider as a main policy or planning gap that must be closed in the Philippines in order for school health and nutrition programs to be even more effective. What are the actions that have already been carried out by the Department of Education to address such gaps? And what do you see still as challenging ahead? Thank you very much. Over to Dr. Dumlao. Uh, thank you very much. As I have mentioned a while ago, we respond to, uh, uh, to laws or uh, uh, issues and concerns on child health and adolescence. So we have uh, uh, RA for mental health, the public act for uh, the implementation of school-based feeding program and nutrition support. Uh, we, have, we have also uh, government uh, policies relating to wash in schools, uh, adolescent reproductive health and the provision of, uh, of uh, medical dental services, as well as uh, uh, substance use prevention. The gap would be to ensure that uh, all of uh, the learners of the country should be rich and uh, that uh, there is a comprehensive in, uh, implementation at the school level. Uh, what uh, we also need to close the gap is that uh, the Department of uh, Health uh, uh, also implements the universal health care. And uh, uh, part of the um, provisions of universal health care is uh, healthy schools. So we have addressed that gap by uh, coming up with a joint administrative order uh, for the implementation of healthy learning institutions. Uh, that includes the DSWD for the preschoolers and then higher education for, uh, the, uh, for uh, the college level. Uh, as well as uh, the uh, test the technical skills education. So this serves as a platform to discuss and come up with standards and provide funding support uh, from uh, Department of Health uh, to ensure that 
we are uh, able to implement the six pillars of the WHO. Six pillars would include policies, uh, social environment, physical environment, links with the communities, and then access to healthcare. Uh, uh, the direction of uh, uh, ensuring that we have strong partnerships from development partners and also working with the Department of Health or the Ministry of Health uh, in addressing uh, uh, adolescent and child health uh, is, uh, is the way to go. And uh, everything to, should be aligned with the directions of uh, WHO and uh, the global commitments for the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we have engaged partners uh, for us to address the gap and come up with technical support, not only at the national level, but also at the sub-national level. Uh, we also need to come up with the monitoring tools so that all the programs, uh, when converged at the national level, shall be translated into activities, school-based activities at the grassroots level, with the message, with the unified message and uh, harmonized um, implementation. Because um, at the national level and the global level, we come up with big programs, but it should be translated into specific activities at the school level. We um, are uh, uh, also one of the GAP is sustainable funding. And uh, thus, uh, for the school-based feeding program, for example, since we have the law for the implementation of uh, school feeding, and we also have this, the, our membership with the School Meals Coalition, we are ensured that we have a budget covering all the wasted and severely wasted learners. Uh, second uh, also gap is uh, during the pandemic, we also need to adjust. Uh, so uh, before we have the hot meals, but with the pandemic, we were able to respond by adopting dry ration and the food is being delivered into the school setting. Uh, we also need to uh, bundle all our programs so that they are not in isolation. So um, we respond uh, utilizing the uh, child and adolescent uh, uh, adolescent health issues, utilizing the life course approach and uh, strengthen our partnership to address funding issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dumlao. And we hear you on the need for the implementation and the translation of policies at local level and how these can be comprehensively monitored to achieve their specific objectives. And on that note, I would like to pass uh, it to Ms. Joyce Tico uh, to talk more on that, on the implementation of activities. Could you please tell us in order to have a whole school approach to promoting and protecting the health and well being, what are the, some implementation barriers that we need to overcome in order for programs to be really effective and respond to the different needs of learners, the teaching, and the non teaching education personnel? Thank you very much for enlightening us with some examples from Fiji. Over to you. Could you please turn on your microphone because we can't hear you? Your audio is still, can you please try again? I think your microphone is still off. Is that okay now? Yes, it is better. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to apologize. I'm not feeling very well. Um, some of the while integrating health education topics in schools. I'm sorry, Ms. Tico, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I'm sorry that you're not feeling well. It seems you are. You have two devices on, so we're getting an echo in the background. So, so so you, okay. 
Please try again now. Mystique, are you able to try again now um, with one device so that we don't have an echo in the background? Thank you. Vera, I hand back to you uh, as well in case we may need to, to forge ahead while Mystico works out uh, her connection. Yes, I think we may, in the meantime, we may move on to- Is that okay? Can oh, yes. Oh, yes, now it's perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> Please come in. Yep. While integrating health education topics in schools can be beneficial, several implementation barriers may arise. Some of the common challenges here in Fiji is the limited resources that we have. Inadequate funding for training, curriculum development, and procurement for necessary resources can hinder the effective implementation of health education programs. Schools struggle to access materials, equipment, and facilities required for practical activities health promotion events, or creating a healthy physical environment. Number two, teacher preparedness. Teachers may lack sufficient training and professional development opportunities to effectively, de to effectively deliver health education. Some may have limited knowledge and confidence in addressing sensitive health topics. Lack of teaching strategies for active learning and time constraints can hinder teachers' ability to integrate health education effectively. Curriculum overload. Schools often face pressure to cover a wide range of subjects and learning outcomes, leaving limited time for in-depth health education. Curriculum constraints and heavy workloads may lead to health education being neglected or treated as an add-on rather than an integral part of the curriculum. Cultural sensitivity. Intr introducing health education topics that challenge traditional cultural norms and practices may encounter resistance or reluctance from certain segments of the community. Balancing cultural sensitivities with the need for evidence-based health information and practices is often a delicate task. Community engagement and support. Limited community involvement and support for health education initiatives can impede their effectiveness. Lack of parental engagement inadequate partnership with community organizations and insufficient recognition of the importance of health education may undermine efforts to create a comprehensive and a comprehensive approach evaluation and monitoring challenges schools may face difficulties in implementing evaluation measures and systems to to assess the impact and effectiveness of health education pro programs. Limited capacity to collect and analyze data, lack of standardized evaluation tools, and limited time for evaluation activities can hinder the measurement of outcomes and evidence-based decision-making. Policy alignment and coordination. Misalignment or lack of coordination between education policies, health policies, and other relevant sectors can pose challenges in implementing comprehensive health education programs. Resistance to change. Resistance from certain stakeholders, including teachers, parents, and students may also who may be resistant to change in tradition teaching practices, or may be uncomfortable discussing certain health topics 
can hinder implementation efforts. To address these barriers, it is essential to engage in a proactive planning, seek support from relevant stakeholders, advocate for resources and policy alignment, provide continuous professional development for teachers and emphasize the importance of health education improving, in improving student well-being. Flexibility, adaptation to local context and a collaboration approach are key to overcoming these challenges and ensuring the successful integration of health education into this schooling experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. I feel you have provided us with a very comprehensive overview on the different challenges and barriers ranging from the policy to the implementation level to the different capacities that are needed to implement these programs. Now we would like to move to a, a next speaker, to Ms. Neha Mala, to share us an example of how Sochai's youth leaders are working to address some of the root causes of children's poor health and compromised well being in Nepal. What are some effective approaches being used by the youth for co creating a health promoting learning environment for Nepalese girls and boys? Over to you, Ms. Mala. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Neha Mola from Kathmandu, Nepal. I'm the co-founder and director of programs at Social Change Makers and Innovators, in short, Sochai. We are a young women-led nonprofit organization that works on the sector of uh, nutrition, menstrual hygiene management, and women and girls empowerment. And we have a unique uh, initiative called the Youth for Nutrition Model, wherein we train and empower young people like us uh, with different kinds of capacity building trainings and workshops based on nutrition, health, and hygiene, and then recruit them as our youth volunteers who get regularly mobilized in the community, uh, reaching out to health centers, schools, and women's and uh, uh, mother's group uh, in the community to educate and create awareness on them regarding the best practices when it comes to nutritional feeding, uh, healthy diet, and balanced diet as well. In regards to school health and nutrition program, we have an uh, innovative model called the Nutrition Boot Camp, you know, which is a four day uh, school program uh, that uh, in captures students from grade six to nine, uh, who are then trained over three day period uh, regarding different topics on health, nutrition, menstrual hygiene management. And on the fourth day of the boot camp, they uh, showcase and demonstrate their learnings in a nutrition exhibition by setting up stalls, which displays posters, IC materials, songs, dances, dramas, and flash mobs, and educates their school peers, teachers, and parents about the kind of learnings they get uh, during those four days of the boot camp. This boot camp model has been widely appreciated and has been found to create a lasting impact in these school children because uh, we found that it's the best way to intervene in the school age children if we want to improve the dietary practices and dietary diversity. Uh, a recent uh, study of the Global Health uh, Nutrition Report found out that uh, the children be between the age of five to 19 year old uh, in Nepal, both the boys and girls, almost 2.5% of them have uh, childhood and adolescent obesity, which is a raising concern for a population like ours. Uh, not just that, uh, three out of the seven provinces in our country uh, have over 45% rate of uh, anemia in 15 to 49 year old women and adolescents. And hence, we are trying to uh, focus our shift in the adolescent and school-based children group because uh, as I mentioned earlier, they tend to retain uh, the information that our group and our volunteers teach them and actually implement into uh, their daily eating and practices. So uh, it's a very rewarding program and school children tend to listen to us more rather than adults and el elderly age group. So uh, we're currently focusing our maximum energy in educating and intervening in the school age children. Uh, also, 
through our boot camps, we then create a school-based health and nutrition club, uh, which involves those uh, children who had participated in the boot camp. And this uh, school-based health nutrition club, in short SBHN, functions throughout the year in the school calendar. Once a month, they gather and coordinate with the school health nurse and the local health workers in the community to organize different programs based on nutrition, like nutritional assessment, BMI measurement, uh, advocacy and education classes on dietary diversity, the uh, benefits of consuming balanced diet. Uh, also, we found that there's a growing trend of maximum consumption of unhealthy and packaged food in the school age children, even during their school meals. And now, even though there's a uh, midday meal program from our Nepal government that provides free meals and uh, healthy and nutritious meals to uh, students up to grade eight. Uh, because of the lack of resources and the minimal uh, education in the school management committee, they end up giving packaged foods and uh, uh, unhealthy foods again during the midday meals as well. So through our boot camp program as well, we've again introduced another program called the food journaling. Uh, method for the school children. Uh, they have a journal diary uh, where they track the kind of food groups that they received in the midday meal program, as in uh, there's a checklist of carbs, proteins, legumes, green leafy vegetables, fruits and veg uh, fruits and other kind of vegetables and animal source of protein and fat. And they just check their midday meal and tick mark on the kinds of food that they uh, received through the school. Uh, through this event, they are eating on a daily basis, as well as uh, they're creating an accountability to the school management team, as well as the school teachers team to provide healthier and more nutritious meals as a part of their midday meal program. Apart from it, another intervention that we are currently focusing is the iron and folic acid and deworming uh, fortification program that our government is conducting. So our government provides uh, iron and folic acid tablets to female uh, adolescents uh, for preventing anemia as a part of their national level intervention. And now through our new boot camps and the SVHN models, we are also tracking the impact and monitoring the effectiveness of the IFA program that our government conducts because it's a big investment in terms of resource and finance. And it's important that we create accountability in terms of having that impact and results in preventing anemia in the adolescent youth group as well. So these were some of the examples that Sochai has been implementing in the school level children. Apart from that, we also have these two innovations, uh, the nutri nutrition bracelet and the menstruation bracelet, which our team innovated. Both these bracelets have been internationally awarded by UNICEF and organizations like One Young World and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So because they are handy tools and accessible, school children can use them as innovative and interactive tools to learn about balanced diet, dietary diversity, as well as menstrual hygiene management. So innovations like these and the food journaling method are some of the techniques that our team and our team of youth volunteers who are exclusively young people from local areas uh, are trying to bring about the change and support the government-based school health nutrition interventions. We are currently partnering with the UNICEF Nepal team to test and launch a national level adolescent training manual on nutrition. And we're now uh, tracking its impact on a national level throughout this year so that we can present its finding and then recommend the government to maybe amplify and scale up our nutrition bootcamp across the seven provinces of Nepal. Uh, these were some of the examples from our team. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Mala. This was really, really interesting. And we also want to thank you for raising all the examples on the triple burden of malnutrition and the importance of the school food environment. We also mm -hmm. see that you have moved on to more innovative mechanisms of social behavior change communication. And it's really interesting to see the bracelets and uh, all the tools and the youth volunteers that you have and especially the child-centered monitoring, which I think is an aspect we should all be moving towards. Now, I would like to pass the floor to Ms. Joyce Tico. I hope she's uh, still connected. And uh, to share with us as an educator from your school experience in Fiji, mm -hmm. can you tell us what 
works best for integrating health education topics in classroom lessons and teaching practices in order to ensure that schools can cultivate learners' knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes for good health and well-being. Over to you, Ms. Tico. Thank you. In Fiji, several approaches have been effective in integrating health education topics into the schooling experience. While specific practices may vary, the following strategies have shown positive outcomes. Number one, whole school approach. During this, we implement a comprehensive whole school approach to health education that involves all stakeholders, including students, teachers, school administrators, parents, and the community. We develop a coordinated plan that integrates health education into various aspects of school life, including the curriculum, policies, practices, and physical environment. We also have health education curriculum. It is designed to address the specific health needs and challenges faced by Fijian students. It incorporates culturally relevant content, local health issues, and traditional knowledge into the curriculum to ensure its relevance and applicability to students' lives. It includes topics such as nutrition, physical activity, mental health, hygiene, substance abuse, prevention, sexual and reproductive health, and non-communicable diseases. Teacher training and a professional development. The school, uh, the Ministry of Education also provides comprehensive training and professional development opportunities for teachers to enhance their knowledge, skills, and confidence in delivering health education. Offer workshops, seminars, and ongoing support to help teachers integrate health education topics into their teaching practices effectively. Foster partnership amongst teachers to share best practices and resources related to health education. This in Fiji is done mostly in the WASH schools, where health promoting schools. We share ideas, we visit each other, and we have a competition to see which is better. Uh, another one is the active and uh, active learning. We also promote active learning approaches that engage students in hands-on activities, group discussions, and real-life applications of health concepts. We encourage student-led initiatives such as health clubs, peer education programs and awareness campaigns to actively involve students in promoting health within the school and the wider community. Integration across subjects. Integrate health education topics with different subjects areas, aligning them with existing curriculum frameworks and learning outcomes. Identify opportunities to infuse health content into subjects like science, physical education, social studies, mathematics, and language arts, providing a multidisciplinary approach to health education. We also engage our communities. For instance, uh, my school is across the village. We normally get our village uh, elders to come in and talk to our children. And we have uh, a day where we set aside um, traditional food where the villagers come and teach the children how to make traditional foods. So this is very, very good. And I think a good way for the children to keep their traditional knowledge. We also involve parents, community leaders, and stakeholders in the planning and implementation of health education. Schools around Fiji also have uh, 
health promotion activities. Here we organize health promotion activities such as health fairs, sport events, cooking demonstration, and wellness challenges to raise awareness and encourage healthy behaviors. Recently, we have started using technology, social media, and community outreach to inform our community about health in about healthy and good life choices. We also have uh, developed a monitoring and evaluation system to assess the effectiveness of health education interventions and make data-driven decisions for improvement. We regularly collect feedbacks from students, teachers, and parents to ensure ongoing re refinement of health education practices. Another, in Fiji, the Ministry of Education recognizes the importance of nutrition in promoting the over well being and academic performance of students. Once a year, in every school around Fiji, health teams are sent to do health checks on students. Um, we also have uh, the Ministry of Education has also developed uh, nutritional guidelines for schools. These guidelines provide recommendations on the types of food that should be offered in schools, emphasizing the importance of balanced meals and limiting the availability of unhealthy food options. Schools in Fiji also are asked to in incorporate nutrition education into the curriculum. This includes teaching students about healthy eating habits, the importance of balanced diet and benefits of consuming local and traditional foods. The Fijian government has implemented policies to restrict the availability of unhealthy foods and drinks in schools. This includes regulations on the sale and advertising of sugary drinks, high fat snacks and other unhealthy food items. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Tico, for the examples from Fiji. We take note of the points that you mentioned on the importance of the community engagement and the involvement of parents, both in the implementation, but also in terms of providing feedback to improve the program. All these points are very important and also the local adaptation of the program and the different channels you're using for social behavior change communication. We would now Thank like you. to move to our last uh, topic. And also I would like to highlight that we have 15 minutes left of this session. So please keep your uh, interventions uh, to the point. We would like to talk now about multi-sector approaches and partner engagement, knowing that institutional coordination and partnerships are really key to the implementation of sustainable programs. And with that, I would like to move back to Dr. Uh, Susi Pereira uh, to explain uh, on the case of Sri Lanka of how multi-sector approaches can ensure that school health and nutrition programs reach the poorest, the most disadvantaged and vulnerable learners. How can we ensure that none of these are left behind? What are some lessons learned and some innovative solutions that are being applied by the Ministry of Health in Sri Lanka? Over to you, Ms. Pereira. Um, thank you. Um, I would like to uh, relate to some of the recent experience with the emergency nutrition plan and, the, um, and some of the interventions that we have on ground. Uh, we have a mechanism that is also being implemented through the presidential secretariat where there is a, a mechanism which uh, goes down to the village level where there are uh, village, uh, the village structure is also alerted on the importance of nutrition. So there is the nutrition um, coordinating body which is uh, looking at food and nutrition security. So the village mechanism, the, dis the divisional mechanism, the district mechanism, provincial and the national. 
So it, there is a cascading uh, mechanism. At the village level, the village also looks at which uh, schools are need to be supported. So uh, the help would actually be giving uh, information to the uh, village uh, coordinating mechanism, which identifies vulnerable schools as well as the children with uh, who are severely malnourished. So in that way, we would know which schools are uh, vulnerable for attention. Yeah, and um, so this is where uh, there is also within this mechanism, there are organizations and the non-governmental organizations which would also support uh, these schools. So this is one way that the multi-sector mechanism is coming up, and there are also uh, uh, there are also direct support which we are concerned of also because um, uh, I'm also the convener at the prime minister's level, uh, which uh, is looking at the food and nutrition security, where we get um, so many requests for schools to be supported with different types of uh, products. So as the, the health sector, we are concerned about what kind of products can be, uh, can go through the, uh, the education system, which can be sometimes also, though it is at this moment uh, giving nutrition, but whether it's really nutrition, you know, whether it can be uh, harmful in the long run. So we are uh, we are kind of uh, having some kind of gatekeeping function there. So these are some of the uh, strong uh, uh, support uh, that we can uh, give to the uh, in getting the other sectors on board. So especially like if you take at the different specific village level, we are uh, we are concerned about what kind of uh, food that is already available, which can be uh, given up. Because like there were, there were like, if you take uh, an understanding that it is these set things, but quite ignoring under this economic crisis, what are the easily available but nutritious food? So this kind of uh, directions are now going to the different sectors which can come in to provide these things uh, at the uh, at the school level also, uh, but this is a very um, you know quite um, you know very recent uh, thing I'm I'm telling you because uh, earlier we had very specific um, you know circulars going uh, specific instructions going, but now uh, things have changed. So we are using the multi sector different uh, mechanism. To, to come in to support the schools, but of course, uh, under careful guidance where we are uh, screening the process. Um, I would like to highlight something very important, and that is the teacher education in, inputs. And I am uh, quite aware that comprehensive education is needed, but the importance of the teacher skills, competencies for this. So this is also something that needs to come out through these kind of discussions. And I was very interested to know about uh, um, the Nepal intervention. I was very much enlightened and I would like to see how uh, Sri Lanka also can benefit by this kind of, uh, uh, you know, if we can organize a, a, a webinar with, uh, your, you know, the kind of things that you're doing and it might attract att attention because we have a lot of uh, grassroots level programs with youth and uh, the, the, it would be very beneficial because how the Family Health Bureau works is also uh, uh, working with the, the youth, uh, adolescents uh, at grassroots level, but having these kind of innovative uh, projects, programs, and, and I, I, I can see that you are mainstreaming some of these things. So I think this will be very useful. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Pereira. It was really interesting, all the examples that you have highlighted to not just only talk about the quality coverage and the adequacy of school health and nutrition programs, but also 
about the responsiveness in the case of a crisis as you're currently facing. And I'm also delighted to hear that uh, this conversation can also have some follow-ups and we can learn from each other and each other's experiences and uh, maybe also uh, start some collaboration between countries uh, to provide our experiences. Now I would like to move to uh, Ms. Neha for the very last question. And uh, maybe you can also compliment uh, uh, the ideas of uh, Ms. Pereira on what have been the key lessons learned from the Sochai experience in working with a range of partners from governmental civil society and newsletter organizations to advocate for and ensure access by all learners to quality school health and nutrition programs. Over to you, Ms. Mala. Thank you. And thank you very much, Dr. Suzy, for such kind words to our intervention. We would most definitely be very much interested to share our learnings and experiences and maybe look for a scope for collaboration uh, with your organization and the Sri Lankan government, if possible. So thank you very much. Uh, now, moving to the question, I think uh, as uh, the leader of a youth-led organization that basically works with the grassroots in the communities, as well as now uh, recently working with the three tiers of government that our country has, the federal, the provincial, and the local level, we're working in coordination with all three tiers and also the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, as well as the Ministry of Federal Affairs and General Administration to uh, test our national level uh, training manual and uh, uh, push recommendations based on the uh, initial research that we are con uh, conducting through our pilot study uh, right now. Um, so uh, we've seen that uh, again, like uh, Dr. Susie and uh, the previous speaker, Ms. Joyce had uh, mentioned, like nutrition is of really uh, multi-sectoral dimension that needs to be addressed. I mean, there are different factors that leads to uh, the nutritional deficiencies, especially in school aged uh, children and adolescents. I mean, there's the factors like wash, gender, and agriculture that comes into integration if we are trying to tackle the problem of nutrition. So that's the approach that uh, we've uh, implemented in Sochai's practices and interventions as well. We constantly work in coordination with government agencies, especially uh, with the um, agency working on uh, Ministry of Agriculture because we're currently testing some models of kitchen gardening for school children to uh, try their hands-on learning modules to grow some nutritious uh, vegetables which are locally available and can be grown in very low resource settings, even in their schools uh, compounds as well, so that whenever we talk and encourage uh, people or children to uh, practice dietary habits, it's important that we ensure that the resources are also available for them because it's not possible to reach out to a food insecure area and preach about balanced diet or dietary diversity. We also have to train and equip them with the resources to gain those kind of foods. Uh, so the link with the agricultural uh, ministry is very key to us, uh, as well as uh, ensuring that there are proper wash facilities in the school, because again, wash, hand washing, hygiene uh, come in hand in hand in terms of maintaining that uh, correct type of nutritional behavior. Uh, there's midday meal program, so we may have to make sure that there are proper hand washing and soap uh, facilities for them so that they do not get any kind of uh, infections or uh, illnesses while consuming their meals. Uh, and uh, apart from that, we also are closely working with the Ministry of Women, Children and Social Development because again, uh, women and girls are still very much uh, uh, backward and you know marginalized in terms of accessing healthcare services, especially in remote and uh, geographically hard to reach areas in our country. So we want to prioritize the issues of women and girls uh, also because they face a lot of discriminatory practices in our community during the menstruation. So it's important that we speak up against these cultural taboos and uh, try our best to ensure uh, gender equity from the very beginning or from school level, 
and have that concept ingrained in the minds of school children if we want to have uh, proper nutrition and good health in all uh, strata of our population. So multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary approach is uh, one key learning for our organization, Sochai, as well, as well as I think uh, having that sense of innovation and learning within the team uh, as the key core value, that's also worked for you very much for us because we are a young team. I think uh, it gives that scope of experimentation and the room to make mistakes uh, a bit more for us rather than to the bigger agencies and the government or civil society or INGOs working in this sector. So I think uh, we have that liberty to try out some small level scaled uh, innovations that might fail or might work as well. But uh, luckily for us, most of our, our innovations have worked and that has helped create that uh, sort of accountability and trust with our stakeholders as well. So I guess, yeah, that's uh, the kind of learnings that we've taken away from Sochai. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your intervention. And I really appreciate this will to innovate and create models that can be then taken over by a larger scale. It's also very good you mentioned the role of agriculture in terms of uh, providing a healthy diet. We all take this point, and especially in the context of the midday meal in Nepal, this is a very important issue. Also the need for a complementary package of interventions that was very well taken and uh, the way you were focusing on WASH to ensure that the uh, uh, school meals and the school health and nutrition can actually be a platform to ensure a wider range of impact, including gender transformative impacts in the society. So uh, we are very, very pleased. <laughs> to hear all these examples from Nepal and hope also that uh, this will inform the thinking elsewhere. And now I would like to pass back to Kuntitaya and thank all the interventions from the panelists. We were really building on each other and, and it was a very enriching discussion. And uh, we would like now to move to the last part of this webinar. Over to you, Kuntitaya. Thank you so much, Ms. Mayor, uh, Ms. Dura. Um, I would say that uh, the previous discussion has been incredibly insightful. We learned a lot of best practices and I'm sure we stand here in solidarity to work for better school health and nutrition. So just a few announcements. Um, I would say that uh, the global report, Ready to Learn and Thrive, School Health and Nutrition Around the World is now available online. So we will drop the link to the report in the chat and for participants and also members listening in from the Facebook Live, um, you can stay tuned. And also a record of this webinar will be uploaded to UNESCO Bangkok on the um, UNESCO Bangkok website. And it is also now available at the UNESCO Bangkok Facebook page. So so um, stay, uh, make sure to stay tuned. And um, as we now move on to the last uh, section of our webinar today, we will have a wrap up and closing remarks by Dr. Adriana Rietzima, Health Specialist at the UNICEF Regional Office for South Asia. Um, Dr. Adriana, I pass the floor to you. Thank you, Titaya, for giving me the floor and the difficult task to um, round up the webinar. Um, I had prepared some points, uh, but I got inspired by the panel members, I think, to, um, you, to hear school health and nutrition in action. So we have this uh, big report and um, we, we, we were listening to um, uh, cases from examples from countries where um, there is a lot of attention to school health and nutrition, where there is focus on um, policy level, but we also heard from implementers. We heard a lot of challenges as well. Um, we heard the importance of engaging the youth also engaging other stakeholders. Um, we heard about, of course, limited resources, but also about being creative, looking for ways and means to make it happen. Um, we um, 
realize that there, there is probably still a gap in, um, in data and information on the health and nutrition of school age and adolescent um, boys and girls, um, including dietary patterns and food choices and physical activity. Um, UNICEF, um, uh, I work for UNICEF, we have increasing attention for um, NCDs and those include um, diseases that are caused by obesity and we realize the importance of prevention so that also um, featured in some of the contributions in this uh, webinar because very often prevention is focused on adults um, yet it starts in children so if you teach children a healthy um, way, a way of healthy living and healthy foods, healthy nutrition, that will um, benefit uh, them in later uh, life. And there is great, um, there's a great platform in schools, not to forget the children that are not in school and the vulnerable children. We need to look for strategies to also um, reach them. Um, yeah, so I, I um, also saw, um, uh, Fira mentioned it already, the opportunities to learn from each other in the region and exchange um, um, ideas and good uh, practices. That's something that um, we can follow up. Um, yeah, and so I like to conclude by, by thanking really the, the presenters who uh, took, who gave their time to prepare for this panel and this webinar and the um, participants who took their time to um, attend. And I hope uh, you also got inspired to do more work on these, in this important um, field. And um, last but not least, my colleagues from the technical working group, you all see the logos um, in the background. Uh, it has been a pleasure uh, working on this webinar and I really hope all partners together with governments, civil society can take it forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the conclusions, Dr. Ariana. Um, I think that we can uh, conclude that this meeting has been incredibly fruitful. Um, just to end this webinar, um, I would like to finish off with a quote um, from Ms. Janelle's presentation. Uh, to effectively transform education, we urgently need to consider the needs of the child as a whole and put learners' well-being at the center of the mission of education now. And I'm sure we can all agree on this statement, and um, this has been resonated many times at the center of our um, change-making policies of putting learners at the center of change-making and also realizing the diversity and the needs of children. Okay, so um, I think that would be the end of our webinar for today. Um, thank you so much to all the relevant partners and also for participants joining us, joining us in from the Zoom and also from the Facebook Live. I would like to end this webinar. Thank you so much.